Welcome to the Healthy Aging Lecture. My name is Kate Chutwapi. I'm the manager in the senior health department here at Virginia Hospital Center. And I am joined today by Dr. Pramija, who is um, one of our um, wonderful infectious disease doctors here in the physician group at Virginia Hospital Center. And she is gonna be talking to us um, about nutrition, but specifically the role in nutrition as it relates to inflammatory and infectious diseases. Um, we all know good nutrition is, is important for our overall health, but I think this will be a really um, interesting way of looking at it and thinking about um, you know, what we put in our body and how that contributes or helps or hinders um, infection and inflammation um, throughout our, our body system. So before I turn it over to uh, Dr. Pramija, I am going to remind everyone that this uh, session, this webinar is being recorded, so you certainly will all get a copy or a link um, so you can hear this recording at any time or share it with anyone that you like, um, including if there's anyone that signed up but didn't join, um, they will get it as well. And I also want to remind you that we do have a, a question box that you can chat in any questions that you have. We will definitely um, be reviewing those questions and have a chance towards the end of the presentation to, to um, go over them. So without further ado, thank you so much, Dr. Pramija, for joining us today. And we're looking forward to your presentation. I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thank you. I'm very happy uh, to talk with you guys today about nutrition and inflammation as part of the Healthy Aging series. Um, a little bit about me, I am an infectious disease doctor and I see patients both in the hospital and in the office, often for follow up from hospitalizations. And I am not a nutritionist, I am not an immunologist, but I am an ID doctor and often our conversations, once we're done talking about the treatment and the antibiotics, they often turn to diet. Um, I see recurrent C. diff infections, which is a very particular diarrheal infection that can make you very sick. I see patients with recurrent urinary tract infections. I see complications from diverticulitis, which is an infection of the bowel. And I see complications from surgeries, um, including elective surgeries like hip replacement, knee replacement, spine surgeries, often done because of wear and tear from uh, weight and obesity. Uh, and I see, of course, lots of different diabetic infections. And the key is, at the end of the day, diet matters. Even with these types of infections, diet matters. So a lot of what I'm going to talk to you today um, comes from this specific field called nutritional immunology. It's a field of study that looks at the influence of nutrition on the immune system. And it asks questions such as, what is the effect of diet on the prevention and management of chronic diseases, infectious diseases, allergies, and cancers? And more specifically, what is the optimal intake of specific dietary factors to maintain that immunologic balance and strengthen our defenses against pathogens? We have a lot of data that tells us that when we have a good nutrient supply and a good nutrient store, we have a good immune system and strong defenses against pathogens. And then the opposite is also true. So a poor nutrient supply leads to poor defenses and greater illness. Um, and this field recognizes that there's an overlap between the immune system, our dietary patterns, and the gut microbiome we keep. So we're gonna explore all of this today. But before we get to that, I wanna take a step back and make sure that we're all dealing with the same framework and understanding, basic understanding of the immune system. And the first question is, what does it mean to be immune? To be immune is to be protected. So our immune system helps protect us against diseases caused by tiny invaders that we call pathogens. It's a network of specialized organs, cells, and tissues that all work together to destroy invaders. Some of these invaders are bacteria, some are fungi, this is aspergillus, some are viruses, this one's COVID, which we know all too well, and some are parasites. Here's a picture of malaria inside our red cells. 
The truth is we are under attack every day in our life. We go to the park, we walk our dog, we play with our grandchildren. There are bacteria and fungi everywhere and our immune system is constantly at work protecting us. So there are two main parts of the immune system. One we call the innate immune system. This is the one you're born with. And one we call the adaptive immune system. And this is the one you develop over time as your body is exposed to microbes or chemicals from those microbes. And then these two systems work together. So when we're looking at that first part of the immune system that you're born with, this is the part that gives us lots of natural protection. The skin is a layer of protection. The cornea of the eye is a layer of protection, and the mucous membranes uh, are layers of protection. So those are the surfaces that line our respiratory tract, our genital, uh, gastrointestinal tract, our genital urinary tract. These are physical barriers to help protect our body. So the innate immune system is our first line barrier, our rapid response mechanism to protect us from invaders. The components of it are inherited from parent to child and are directed against molecules expressed only by microorganisms. Some of the terms that you will hear today that are part of the innate immune system include white cells that we call leukocytes, phagocytes, and neutrophils. The other part of the immune system is called the adaptive immune system. This is the part you develop over time, and I liken it to the analogy of building your library. Cells that are part of this library of our adaptive immune response include lymphocytes, B cells, and T cells, and you will hear me mention these as well. Within this adaptive immunity or acquired immunity, there are two ways that we build our library. One is actively where we respond to an infection, we catch COVID, or we get a vaccine, for example, against COVID, or we can have passive immunity. And passive immunity means that you get antibodies from someone else. We can either get antibodies passed from mother to child through breastfeeding, for example, or we can actually give antibody infusions to give protection. So this is an example, this picture shows the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system working together. And this is the machinery that helps protect us. Our body is exposed to a pathogen, a microbe, and then we have parts of our innate immune system that activate, they recognize it, give a handshake, um, so to speak, and talk to the adaptive immune system. They pull in T cells and B cells, which help protect us and then kill that microbe. So that's when things work properly. This picture is, this diagram shows the immune system and all the components in a, in a, um, in a different way. The key is, again, we have the innate immunity and these are some terms you're gonna hear today. And then we have acquired immunity, some other terms you're going to hear today. We talk about T cells and B cells and the way they talk to each other through different molecules such as interferon, tumor necrosis factor, interleukins. These are all these signaling molecules that are involved in the function of the immune system. So I just wanted to give you an overall framework as we bring up these terms today. So what triggers an immune response? So there are many things that tri trigger an immune response. Number one, antigens. So these are substances that the body labels as foreign and harmful. This does include allergens as well. Inflammation also triggers an immune response. So that is when a pathogen attacks healthy tissue. The body counterattack is to generate mast cells, which release histamine. Histamine triggers white cells. We get prolonged inflammation and tissue damage, and this can overwhelm our immune system. Autoimmune disorders can also trigger an immune response. Examples are lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, type 1 diabetes. The immune cells attack and destroy healthy cells. And then finally, immunodeficiency disorders such as AIDS, leukemia, multiple myeloma. The body defenses are so reduced that a person becomes very susceptible to infection. So there are a number of factors that influence the immune system. You can see here um, gut microbiota, nutrient intake, frailty, body fat, stage of course of life, stress, 
physical fitness, certain environmental factors, and then um, factors related to illness. So illness, medication, genetics, and our infection history, these all influence the immune response. Specifically, there are factors that weaken or depress our immune response, including poor diet, malnutrition, excess weight, older age, chronic mental stress, environmental toxins, and chronic diseases. What I'd like to focus on today are three factors that influence our immune system. One is our stage uh, life, uh, stage and course of life, so older age. That's something we can't change. But two factors that we can change are our gut microbiota and our nutrient intake. So I'd like to start with talking about the effect of aging on the immune system. When we think about the aging immune system, there are two key terms that come to mind. One is called inflammaging. So it's an amalgam between inflammation and aging. And that's just recognizes the association of advanced age and chronic low-grade inflammation. The other is immunosenescence, meaning that immune competence or how well our immune system works diminishes with age. As we age, we have an altered number of immune cells. We have decreased output of cells from the bone marrow. And at the same time, our thymus starts to shrink. So it stops putting out as many T cells. So it can't respond to new antigens or pathogens. Additionally, as we age, besides that, our, what we have left just doesn't work as well. So neutrophils show impaired phagocytosis or bacterial killing. So they don't recognize and kill the pathogens like they should. Natural killer cells have impaired cytotoxicity um, towards infected cells with viruses and tumor cells. So again, another set of cells does not kill like it should. The dendritic cells have impaired response to immune signaling. So the dendritic cell here in the center is supposed to give all these handshakes and it just doesn't do it as well. And then T cells have reduced ability to produce cytokines. For example, interleukin-2 and interferon. These are all those signaling molecules that allow for a crosstalk between the cells. And then we have altered antibody production by the B cells. And these antibodies, again, identify and target cells for destruction. Beginning in the sixth decade of life, the immune system undergoes a dramatic age-related changes. We have loss in the ability to protect against infection because we have decreased cells, NK cells, uh, are not as strong, the T cells are low, uh, we can't support wound healing, our response to vaccines is impaired and reduced, and then our inflammation increases in both intensity and duration. And studies have shown, interestingly, that that um, change is actually more robust in men than in women. After age 65, men show higher innate and pro-inflammatory immune activity and lower adaptive immune function, so less robust of a response to infection. All of those changes are what we call immunosenescence or decreased competence within the immune system. Superimposed on that are additional challenges with aging and malnutrition. It's, malnutrition isn't just important in children, it's important as we age as well because uh, we still encounter nutritional deficiencies. Uh, challenges for the elderly include disability. Some people might not be allowed to drive. They can't see. They don't have access to the food like they used to. Diseases in and of itself create challenges. And then even if it's not the disease, you can have disease-associated anorexia or anorexia, meaning not wanting to eat, associated with the medicines to treat the disease. Also, you know, some people engage in poor food selection. People either aren't helping them or they're not sort of supervising the food selection. And of course, a lot of people are on a fixed income and food is expensive, so they don't have the options that they used to. So we can't modify a lot of the changes with aging, but we can modify our diet. So the question is, how does diet influence our immune function? So we're going to talk a little bit about diet and the gut. And when we talk about the gut, the gut is a physical barrier. So this is part of our innate immunity. And so there's a great interplay between the gut and our innate immune system. I'm going to go over this diagram here. This is the brush border of the gut or our intestinal lining. And we'll talk about that in a little more detail. So within this border here, you have the gut epithelium or lining. We have lots of different cells called intestinal epithelial cells. We have panis cells, 
goblet cells, enterocytes, enteroendocrine cells, and intestinal cells. So this network of cells here works with the immune uh, system to form a dynamic physical and biochemical barrier. And so this barrier responds to microbial stimuli and it, distinguished between, it distinguishes between signals from good bacteria in our gut and bad bacteria or pathogenic microorganisms. What are some of the things that it does? Well, this barrier works to create a balance. And uh, I'm gonna go through some of these terms, but just to give you a general idea. So we have inflammasomes that give you an interleukin release. This is a signaling molecule that helps give us mucus and antimicrobial peptides to release into the gut. So uh, basically proteins that help kill bad bacteria. We have IgA secreting B cells. So B cells give our antibodies that regulate these uh, microbial populations to keep things in balance and maintain homeostasis. We have signaling of commensal bacteria. So we have bacteria that are actually sending signals to our gut lining cells to induce tolerant macrophages, regulatory T cells, and lymphoid cells. So the bacteria in our gut are talking to the lining of our gut and telling it to, um, telling our immune system, hey, this guy is okay. So we call all of this a crosstalk. So there's a crosstalk between commensal bacteria, the cells of our gut, and different immune cells that support a tolerant environment within the intestine that suppresses that inflammatory response. Within the gut, there are three main types of bacteria, broad categories. We have bacterioides, Prevotella, Rumococcus. But the ratio and additional factors can change, right? Because our gut is constantly responding to environmental factors. This includes diet, medical interventions, socioeconomic conditions, stress, um, age, gender, body weight, sleep, smoking, alcohol. Although of all these, food intake and our dietary habits have the most influence on the richness of the microbes of our gut. And when we have an imbalance of those microbes in our gut, we can have a disturbed barrier and induce inflammation. So this is a diagram showing an immune tolerant gut or a happy gut. We have bacteria that are present in the gut and when it's working properly, sometimes we get bacteria that are then identified and presented, um, presented to the T cells. And then the T cells through crosstalk keep a balance. So we have a balance between uh, less inflammation and more inflammation and everything is happy. And I will point here that the gut has a nice barrier that's intact and has nice connections between all of the cells. So this is a happy gut. What happens when we have gut imbalance? So a reduction of this tolerance favors um, immune-mediated diseases such as inflammatory bowel disease. Also, when we have hyperglycemia or high blood sugars, that can disrupt that barrier permeability and we end up with a leaky gut where we end up with microbes and microbial metabolites getting into the system where they otherwise shouldn't. So we call this aging associated dysbiosis or imbalance. It promotes intestinal permeability, systemic inflammation, and macrophage dysfunction, meaning those cells that are supposed to gobble up the bacteria just don't work well. So knowing all of this, what is, what is the best diet? What should I eat? Is there something that helps my immune system stay strong? Is there something that I should avoid? So does an immune boosting diet exist? Well, the truth is there are certain dietary patterns that may better prepare the body for attack, but there's no specific food out there that offers any individual extra special protection. Each stage of the body's immune response relies on many micronutrients for the growth and function of immune cells. I'm gonna be talking a lot about micronutrients, so I wanna define that and compare that to macronutrients. Um, macronutrients are types of food that are required in large amounts in our diet. So examples, fats, proteins, carbohydrates. Whereas micronutrients are chemical elements or substances that are only required in trace amounts for the normal growth and development of living organisms. So 
this is a very busy slide and I, I do it for emphasis. So this is a summary of the various effects of micronutrients on different aspects of immunity. And the key here is that there are lots of micronutrients. They all have an important role in our immune system at multiple stages, barrier function, role of cellular aspects of innate immunity, and then also with adaptive immunity in the T cells and in B cells. So it's all important, and that's my point. So what do micronutrients do to support our immune response? They're the fuels for the immune system to function properly. They are the building blocks for us to make RNA and DNA to produce proteins, including antibodies, cytokines, which are those signaling molecules, and acute phase reactants. They are the substrates or the building blocks for the production of immune active metabolites. Um, arginine is a substrate for nitric oxide, for example. Um, regulators, they are regulators of immune cell metabolism, specifically vitamin A and zinc are some of our biggest regulators. They also have some specific antibacterial and antiviral functions, again, back to zinc and vitamin D. Um, they are regulators that protect us from inflammatory or oxidative stress. Oxidative stress leads to inflammation, so they help reduce that. And they are substrates for the actual intestinal bacteria, which we just reviewed, helps modulate the immune system. When we look at diets and dietary patterns, there's a robust amount of data comparing the Mediterranean diet to the Western diet. When we look at the Mediterranean diet and we look at the base of the food pyramid, we see that the base is fresh fruits and vegetables or high fiber, whole natural foods. And this promotes symbiosis or a happy gut. Um, when we look at the Western diet, we see that the base of the pyramid is really in processed foods of lower fiber. And we see very little of the fresh fruits and vegetables. So there are other uh, cultures that have bases of fresh fruits and vegetables, such as Japanese, such as Korean. But like I said, the wealth of the data is on the Mediterranean diet, so that's what I'm going to focus on today. Um, but there are other diets as well that are very good for you. <clears throat> so first I want to talk about the Western diet. This is our diet, essentially. Um, the hallmark of the Western diet are ultra-processed foods. What is a processed food? A processed food is a food that's changed in any way from its natural state. This includes washing, canning, freezing, or adding any ingredients to it. Baking, cooking, and prepping also counts as processed. Um, ultra processed foods specifically are typically high energy, dense products, high in sugar, high in unhealthy fats, and low in dietary fiber, protein, vitamins, and minerals. There's actually a food classification system to help us define what ultra-processed foods are. They are defined by a NOVA classification system according to the extent and purpose of processing. It considers all the physical, biological, chemical methods used during food manufacturing, processing, and the use of additives. So low NOVA scores would be the broccoli or the apple, so raw and minimally processed. Processed culinary ingredients would get a classification level two. Um, an example there would be, for example, honey or tomatoes in a jar. Processed foods would be, for example, canned corn, canned green beans, and then ultra processed foods, soda would be an example. So here is a schematic, another way to show where we are on the process scale. You can see minimally processed would be corn on the cob. Processed would be corn in the can, and then ultra processed would be the corn chip. So how do we identify a processed food? The trick is you gotta read the label. Does it contain, and ask yourself, does it contain at least one item um, of this NOVA classification system? But the simpler question is, is it something that I would never use in the kitchen? If it's got terms like high fructose corn syrup, hydrogenated oils, intensified oils, hydrolyzed proteins, that's a processed food. If on the label it has additives to make it uh, the final product more palatable and more appealing, such as flavors, color enhancers, that's a processed food, and we probably want to avoid it. 
why are ultra processed foods battery bad for you there have been a number of studies showing all the increased um, health problems associated with consumption of ultra processed foods uh, studies show an increase in all-cause mortality, an increase in cardiovascular disease, an increase in coronary artery disease, hypertension, all forms of the metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, obesity. It's even associated with depression, irritable bowel syndrome, all kinds of cancers, including postmenopausal breast cancer, gestational obesity, wheezing and asthma, especially in young children functional dyspepsia and frailty. So the more ultra processed foods you consume, the greater risk of these conditions. So what do ultra processed foods do to the immune system specifically? So what's interesting is that they contribute to gut changes that select for microbes that are associated with inflammatory diseases. Um, when we process the food, we change the structure of it. We alter the food matrix of the fiber and fat content, and that affects the bacteria in our gut and those bacteria host interactions. When we have minimally processed or natural foods, those foods have intact fiber cell walls that provide a substrate or a surface for those fiber degrading bacteria in the colon, and it ensures that the, we have a slow release of micronutrients all the way along the digestive tract. What's most fascinating to me is that even when we say, I'm gonna have a high fiber diet, but that diet is derived from ultra processed foods, we have a reduced abundance of microbes. So our body knows that there have been changes. So is there a diet to avoid? Um, yes, diets that are limited in variety and lower in nutrients, for example, um, containing ultra processed foods can negatively affect our immune system. The Western diet, which is rich with refined sugars, red meat, can disrupt healthy intestinal microorganisms and it can result in chronic inflammation of the gut. So what about the Mediterranean diet? The Mediterranean diet has been shown to be immunoprotective um, and reduce chronic inflammation. And specifically, a lot of studies look at not just the Mediterranean diet, but what they call the Mediterranean dietary pattern, because there are a number of countries in the Mediterranean that have a slight variability in their diet, um, and there's benefit to all of that. What's common amongst all those countries and all those cultures is an abundance of olive oil, and also high consumption of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds. Uh, they have a moderate consumption of fish, white meat, eggs, fermented dairy, and small amounts of red meat, um, processed meat, or foods high in sugar. And frequent but moderate uh, wine intake with meals, and it's usually red wine. When we look at sort of the breakdown of what they're eating, the Mediterranean dietary pattern is actually a high fat intake diet. 40 to 50% of the daily calories come from fat but the fat is low in saturated fat and high in monounsaturated fat. Up to 25% of the fat comes from the olive oil, which is so important. And then we have high omega-3 fatty acids from the fish and the plants. We have high dietary fiber, and the foods have a low glycemic index and low glycemic load. So now we compare and contrast our gut. We have the Mediterranean diet, which is rich in all these building blocks for the micro microbes of our gut. And we have an immune tolerant gut. We have cells that are close together. We allow some of those micronutrients in. We have great intestinal barrier integrity and we have a happy gut with immune tolerance. On the right side, we have the Western diet with a very poor food matrix. We have refined sugars, we have low quality fats, processed red meat, salt additives. And we see that our gut barrier is leaky. We can't even form our barrier to protect ourselves. So we have a leaky gut. We have altered bacteria within the gut and altered metabolites. And this leads to an incredible amount of inflammation and endotoxemia. So all these bacteria or toxins are just pouring into our gut and it's not happy. 
There are a number of uh, studies uh, over many years, actually, that show various effects of the Mediterranean diet on overall inflammation. This one, the um, PREDIMED study, was done in Europe, and it was a randomized controlled trial that looked at the protective effects of the Mediterranean diet in those at high risk for cardiovascular disease. It was a large study of over 7,000 participants, and it looked at the Mediterranean dietary pattern versus a low-fat diet. They found that olive oil and nuts reduced cardiovascular disease by 30%, and that adherence to a Mediterranean dietary pattern was associated with a reduction in diabetes, metabolic syndrome, hypertension, this oxidative stress, which induces inflammation, um, and endothelial dysfunction. And so here is a diagram of an endothelial cell. So endothelial cells are the cells that line our blood vessels. And we can see here with the Mediterranean diet, it actually blocks or inhibits the pathway that leads to plaque instability. And the Mediterranean diet actually promotes plaque stability. Why is this important? Because if we have plaques on our blood vessels, we do not want them to break off and cause a heart attack or a stroke. So it's very important. What about the Mediterranean diet and cancer? Well, we have known since the 1950s that the Mediterranean diet has been associated with a decreased risk of cancer. There was a large study back in the 1950s called the Seven Countries Study, and there was a follow-up study called EPIC, which showed that a greater adherence to the Mediterranean dietary pattern was associated with a lower incidence of cancer. Specifically, the EPIC study showed that 4.7% of cancers in men and 2.4% of cancers in women could have been avoided with a greater adherence to the Mediterranean type pattern. There was another study out of Europe called the SUVAMAX study that found that the best prevention for cancers was a rich and varied diet of fruits and vegetables. And then more recent years, we've had the World Cancer Research Foundation that report that 30 to 40 percent of cancer deaths could, per year could be prevented with the right diet. I think that's very powerful. There was a large um, meta-analysis, so it looks at multiple studies, so 12 studies over many years with 1.5 million participants, and they concluded that the Mediterranean diet was associated with a 6% decrease in mortality from cancer. Not only does the Mediterranean diet affect our risk of cancer, but it's also been shown to be of benefit in neurodegenerative diseases. So they found that a higher adherence to the Mediterranean diet pattern is associated with reduced cognitive decline and protected, protection against depression. And the micro and macronutrients as part of the Mediterranean diet are protective against dementia and pre-dementia syndromes. And the opposite, we found that saturated fatty acids, remember the Mediterranean diet is monounsaturated, the saturated fatty acids increase our risk for Alzheimer's dementia. This is a question that comes up in my office often, I'd say at least once or twice a week. Watching my diet is just too hard. Can't I just take a supplement? I Just tell me what pills to take and I'll take it. Don't, don't tell me what to eat. Um, so, what I thought was really interesting was just uh, last month, I saw this uh, news story um, hit the pages. Tech mogul Brian Johnson, 45, spends $2 million a year to get an 18-year-old body. So what did he do? So he claims that he made up this um, impressive routine and cut his biological age by five years. So what did this guy do? Clearly, he was in search of this Ponce de Leon fountain of youth. And he says that his biological age has been reduced by five years with a strict regimen controlled by doctors. He had a very strict daily routine. He called this regimen Project Blueprint. And I have the website there in case you want to read more about it in detail. But first part, he adhered to a strict vegan diet of 1,977 calories a day. He had a daily exercise regimen of an hour, a high intensity exercise regimen three times a week. He went to bed at the exact same time every night, had blue light reduction. And then to track all of this project, he had measurements of every organ in his body, included blood tests, MRIs, and monthly colonoscopies. 
Upon waking in the morning, he would drink a smoothie that he called the Green Giant, which you can see here on the right. It included ingredients such as spermidine, creatine, collagen peptides, and coca flavonoids. And then throughout the day, he took over 100 pills, including lots of different supplements and off-label medications, so garlic, ginger root. He took off-label metformin and lithium, but key to what his doctors had told him, no processed foods. Um, I don't know about you, but this is not a way that I want to live my life. Um, the green giant is not appetizing for breakfast at all. But, you know, the question is, are there some supplements that may be of benefit in some people? So I wanted to take a pause on diet and talk just a little bit about supplements, because it's a question that comes up a lot. So we know that vitamin D as a micronutrient has a lot of benefits for the immune system. The overall effect of vitamin D on the immune system is stimulatory. When we have it in good amounts, we have a decreased inflammatory cytokine response, increased tolerance, we have good gut diversity. So there are, when we look at vitamin D as a supplement, as a pill, some studies have shown some good effects on some outcomes in certain groups. So clearly there's not um, a wealth of data showing benefit, but in some conditions, for example, tuberculosis, we know that addressing vitamin D deficiency helps cure tuberculosis better. There's some role in upper respiratory infections, diseases like hepatitis C and an HIV. There are also some groups who show more benefits, so low-income households, pregnant women, lactating women, infants, toddlers, those who are critically ill, and those who are elderly. So it seems that the people who um, need to generate that immune response more and the people who are more likely to be deficient are the ones who are more likely uh, to show benefit from vitamin D supplements. But for the rest of us, the data is very mixed. What about garlic? We hear a lot about garlic. We cook with garlic, we eat garlic. What if you just don't like it and you wanna take a pill? So the active ingredient in garlic pills are allicin stavium. We hear that garlic is good because it reduces inflammation. It keeps our platelets from clumping together. It's good for cardiovascular disease. Well, there was one review that pulled together about 146 patients taking garlic supplements specifically, and they found for three months they had fewer occurrences of the cold than those taking placebo. But once people caught a cold, similar duration of illness. Um, so not very robust data there. What about zinc? Zinc is very interesting because um, you know, it's very important for the immune system uh, in small amounts. It's important for immunomodulation, um, for key stress pathways, and it's involved in that pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory response. Um, and when we don't have it, we have a decreased number of immune cells. The issue with zinc, though, is that if we have too much, it's also bad. We can lower our HDL, which is our healthy, good cholesterol. We can lower our copper levels. We lower our magnesium levels. So um, there's a delicate balance there. So studies show that it's the children and the elderly that are at the highest risk for zinc deficiency. So these populations specifically may benefit from a supplementation, but both zinc deficiency and zinc overload can impair your immune function. And that leaves a very narrow range of benefit. So it's a little bit tricky. And that's probably why a lot of the studies don't show as much of a benefit as we would have thought. Another supplement people ask me about is green tea or tea cachectins. So green tea in and of itself has a lot of antioxidants and it's supposed to have a wide array of health benefits. But what about the tea capsule? So there were only two trials recently that found that green tea capsules produce less cold and flu symptoms than the placebo. But both of those studies were funded by um, the tea industry, and all the other benefits that you read about are extrapolated from animal models. They're not studies done in people. So we just don't have the data there. <clears throat> Lastly, probiotics. Uh, this question comes up a lot. So probiotics have been shown over many studies to enhance resistance to infection. So fermented milk containing products that have lactobacillus 
have been shown to reduce the duration of respiratory and gastrointestinal infections and reduce the common cold, the risk of the common cold. And that's been repeated many times over. There's also some interesting data on the role of probiotics and seasonal allergies, but at this point, that data is more mixed. Um, when patients come to me and ask about probiotics, they also ask about the difference between probiotics and prebiotics. So on the bottom, you see pictures of various probiotics. So probiotics are foods that contain live or healthful bacteria. So live culture foods, kefir, yogurt, fermented vegetables, such as sauerkraut, kimchi, miso, tempeh, and kombucha. So those are pretty common examples of probiotics we can find at various grocery stores. Prebiotics are foods, um, going back to what we talked about at the beginning, foods that contain fibers that feed and maintain the healthy gut bacteria. So garlic, onions, asparagus, Jerusalem artichokes, dandelion greens, bananas, seaweed, leeks, those help build a healthy gut bacteria. So what are my take home points for supplements? What do I tell people? I say that no supplement should be considered as a substitute for a good diet because no supplement contains all the benefits of healthy food. Not only that, but our body processes foods very differently than we process a supplement or a tablet. And the best example I can give of that is something called food synergy. So we have learned, we know now, that if you have a bowl of pasta with tomato sauce and then you add cheese, the cheese actually has micronutrients in it that help your body absorb the pasta sauce and those micronutrients even better than if you had chosen not to add the cheese. So that's an example of food synergy. And then finally, and this may be the most important point, but these supplements are unregulated by the FDA. So the truth is you really don't know what you're putting in your body. You may see that the label says selenium, but you don't know what the dose is and you don't know what's really in that pill. And that's where the danger comes in. So, you know, I think that there's a good role for probiotics in the diet. I think there's a pretty good role for vitamin D, especially if you are deficient. And this is one area where it's very difficult to get adequate levels of vitamin D, especially, you know, in the wintertime when we have less sun. And I think potentially in the right population. So we're back to the what should I eat? And you know, the question is, are there anti-inflammatory foods that everybody eats every day that would be good choices? So this takes me to the blue zones. So researchers from National Geographic asked this question and looked at parts of the world that have the longest living centenarians, the, long, the greatest number of people over 100. And there were five areas that were identified. Loma Linda, California, Nicoya, Costa Rica, Sardinia, Italy, Icaria, Greece, and Okinawa, Japan. And within these five areas, there were quite a few similarities. The focus on these cultures was on a healthy diet, regular physical activity, social connectedness, spirituality, and stress management. And within that, um, there were also key foods that through all parts of the world that these people were eating, but the focus on the food was also on how the food was grown, how it was prepared, how it was served. So their diets had a lot of beans or legumes, whole grains, sweet potatoes, tofu, olive oil, tomatoes, squash, leafy greens and cruciferous vegetables, and nuts and seeds. And um, so you can read more about this, um, reading about the Blue Zones by Dan Buettner. And there are even, as a spinoff to his initial book, there are a number of cookbooks about it too, focusing on some of these recipes and food compounds. So what do we do practically? We've been through a lot of information today, but how do we put all of this information together and, uh, tackle the grocery store, tackle our lunch and dinner every day. How, how do we make this work? 
And the key, these are my practical tips. This is what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the key is really in preparation. So before you go shopping, make sure you have a nice collection of recipes that you're gonna work from. And I find that the best recipes out there really come from cookbooks. I often go to the library and check out those cookbooks, um, reputable chef websites. Um, the truth is I don't think you're gonna find winning recipes because I've looked. Um, on most Facebook sites or Instagram or Pinterest. There's a lot out there that I can tell you I look at and it's just not gonna work and it doesn't taste good. You know, we have this idea that everything's on the internet and the truth is a lot of these cookbooks with really wonderful recipes are not on the internet. So I think it's worth a little bit of extra research to find some nice recipes. Look for simple recipes, right? Um, five ingredients or less is really key. If it's too complicated, it's gonna be unnecessarily difficult. The other thing is that if you are buying high quality foods, the food tastes good, the vegetables taste good. You don't need to smother it in lots of sauce and other ingredients. Um, keep a well-stocked pantry of staple items. So this is really important to keep you from having to run out to the grocery store all the time. And think about the themes of the foods that you like to cook. Is it Mediterranean? Is it Asian? Because otherwise you're gonna be staring at your, pa your pantry and looking at combining soy sauce with olives and that's just not gonna work. So I tend to cook in the Mediterranean theme. So I tend to keep tomatoes, pastas, um, olives, capers, those sorts of themes on hand so I can combine um, combine dishes pretty easily without running to the grocery store. Um, meal planning is very important. If you could plan when you go to the grocery store for a few days, um, that would be great. Or if you can plan the week, even better. Um, if your planning involves cooking large batches and recipe stacking, I will talk more about that. That can be very helpful, especially if you don't have a lot of time. Um, at the store, really important, shop the sales. Shop the sales for two reasons. One, it keeps costs get down. Two, it encourages you to perhaps look at foods that you otherwise wouldn't have purchased. So it contributes to that diversity. Shop seasonal. So the foods that are seasonal are gonna be fresher. They're gonna taste better, period. And they're probably gonna be a little bit cheaper. Strive for diversity. And by diversity, I mean a diversity of color and of flavor in your meal. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Consider the nutrient density of the vegetables and the fruits when you're purchasing them and shop at the periphery of the grocery store because you want to avoid most of those ultra processed foods. And most importantly, especially now with supply chain issues, with food recalls, you've got to stay flexible. And then when you get home, if the recipe lends itself, rather than cutting it in half, consider cooking the whole large batch and maybe freezing something for future meals. And as another sort of cost savings tip, maybe consider keeping a little pot of fresh herbs. Not everybody can has a green thumb or has land for a garden or has a sunny spot. That's a lot of work. But I think everyone has a window with a little bit of sun and you can keep a thyme plant um, and maybe some rosemary alive for some time. And that really helps and improve the flavor of the food and fresh herbs are also a source of wonderful micronutrients. So I talked about recipe stacking. So I have borrowed this term from the internet when they talk about habit stacking or keeping a house clean. And it, the idea is you're combining one activity with another. So for example, I have a couple hours on a weekend, I'll make a big pot of chicken soup with chicken breasts on the bone. I'll serve part of that for dinner that evening, maybe with some pasta, and then I save the rest for the future. And I think about what recipes I'm gonna make. Do I shred the chicken and add it with a salad? Do I put it in a chicken pot pie? And then I might freeze the broth that's left over. Maybe I am familiar with the recipes I use. So I freeze four cups that'll go into a tomato soup for the future. And I might freeze two cups that'll go for a different soup appetizer down the road. So that's the recipe stacking. stacking. I've engaged in one activity, but now I have four meals. Um, we said strive for diversity. So one of the sayings is taste the rainbow. So the rainbow or the color of the food is a nice natural reminder that we're getting different micronutrients based on the color. Don't even need to know what all the micronutrients are. Just know that if you're eating a variety of color within your day, that you're getting a nice variety of food. The other way to taste the variety is that we want 
um, variability in the taste of our fruits and vegetables. Sweet items have different micronutrient um, densities or micronutrient components than the bitter vegetables. You can see this table on the right and we can see that the composition, for example, of vitamin A is very different in the sweet potato than in the bitter corn. So those are two ways nature has reminded us to stay diverse. Um, the other point I made was to shop the periphery of the store. We want to stay in this section of the grocery store and try to avoid this section. If you can stay out of these aisles, that's a pretty good way to ensure that you're going to avoid the ultra processed foods. Um, occasionally, it's okay to go into the center if you need some high protein cereals, some nut butters, um, beans, canned tomatoes, those sorts of things. And then the last point I wanted to make was about nutrient density. So what is that? That is the amount of beneficial nutrients in a food product in proportion to its energy content, weight, or um, countered against detrimental nutrients. Other terms are nutrient rich or micronutrient dense. So this is an article um, that came out in 2014, Defining Powerhouse Fruits and Vegetables, a Nutrient Density Approach. And this really changed, when I read this, this sort of changed my perspective on going to the grocery store. Towards the end of this article, they define and rank powerhouse fruits and vegetables by nutrient density scores. I printed it out, I taped it to my refrigerator, and I would glance at it every week before going to the grocery store so that I could make the most informed decisions when shopping. So for example, spinach is very high up on this list. I think iceberg lettuce is on page four or five. So rather than making a salad with iceberg lettuce, I sought to make a salad with spinach. So I could check that box and make sure I was getting more of my nutrients in my day. So a few parting thoughts here. I think we've reviewed and understand that there is a complex relationship between nutrition and immunology and that our nutritional status and our patterns of food intake can affect our immune system and while changing our diet may be difficult when we start to build habits habits create patterns and it's something that we're more easy to follow that is more easy to follow over time i found this quote when i was doing research for this topic and i just loved it you can't change the number of candles on your birthday cake, but you can change how you feel and function as you get older. No injections, serums, or surgeries required. The secret to healthy aging isn't found in a medicine cabinet or a medical clinic. It's in the kitchen. And I think that this couldn't be more true. So to end, I usually just say thank you. But today I wanted to end with a quick and easy recipe for a soup. Um, to kind of encourage anyone who's feeling motivated to eat healthy this weekend. It's going to be cold. I think there's nothing better than a nice healthy soup. Um, this soup has lots of healthy vegetables of different colors. It has legumes. It has the protein that you need. Um, and it doesn't take long at all. Um, so with that, I am going to wrap up and say thank you and open the floor to questions. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Pramija. That was fantastic. Um, like your presentation was dense <laughs> with just wonderful information. So <laughs> thank you so much for all of that. Um, I am thinking though, there probably there's so many good slides that you have. Perhaps, I don't mm -hmm. know, we'll talk about sharing the slides or sure. maybe at least some of the slides, for example, sure. this recipe and some others. So I just wanted to let folks know that we will um give you at least some or all of the presentation as when I send out the, the link next week with the recording. So okay. um, just to put just to put that out there, if that's OK with you. Sure. Um, so we did have a couple um, questions that came in and we'll use the last few minutes that we have to go over them, if you don't mind. Um, question yeah. about um, just kind of about the supplements, um, recognizing that the supplements aren't FDA approved. Um, this audience member was wondering if there are any particular trustworthy brands or anything to look for uh, if you are, you know, purchasing a supplement. Um, so some of the brands that are a little more trustworthy are the, um, the Kirkland brands are pretty good. And then uh, some of the brands that they stock at Whole Foods are also pretty good. Um, but if you're going to take a supplement, I think the other real key is to make sure that there are no drug interactions with the medicines that you're also prescribed, um, because the supplements can be metabolized through the liver, 
and then they can affect the way those liver enzymes work to break down your other medicines. So that's really important as well. Yes, and should they also be looking for that USP verified mark? Does that do you feel like that makes a difference to? Or not you know, I just don't know anymore. There have been so many recalls <laughs> on so many items. <laughs> Got it. You know, okay. like right now we're dealing with the whole recall on the eye drops. And so we really don't know. I, I don't think that a trademark really makes me feel more secure. Okay. Got it. All right. Um, let's see here. Some questions about some specific foods, recognizing you're not a nutritionist, but you certainly have a <laughs> yeah. in depth knowledge here. Um, any thoughts about whole milk dairy versus reduced fat dairy products? Uh, so that's actually really interesting. So I had done a personal deep dive on this issue um, a while back when I was looking at what, um, like, what what is two percent milk? What is skim milk? What's really fascinating is when you look at the processing of the milk. So skim milk is no fat. So when you take out the fat, you're actually taking out vitamin D, and then you have to artificially go in and put back synthetic vitamin D. The, the other thing that's interesting is that when they process the milk, the skim milk, since it doesn't have the fat in it, it's reduced down to this blue powder, and then it's they add water to make it look like milk, and then they add the vitamin D. So in my book, that seems like way too much processing for what I'm going to ingest. So I my habit was to switch to 2% milk rather than the 1% or the skim. And I'm happy with that. The 2% seems to be sufficient and it doesn't have that level of processing. It still has the natural vitamin D and not the artificial. Excellent, that's great. Um, some questions about, you know, folks, obviously we wanna get the fresh whole fruits and vegetables, but you know, people have the option also of the frozen, of the canned, um, any thoughts on, you know, Yes. those options so, as well and, and when they should come into play in your diet. Sure. So I would take canned off the table for uh, multiple reasons. So the canned have a lot of preservatives. They have a lot of added sugar. And then there are also the interactions between the can itself. So the aluminum lining of the can and when you put an acid into it, it can leach chemicals into the food. Um, so one of the issues, not only when we talk about ultra processed foods is the processing, but then the whole other side of things is the packaging and what does that do to our bodies? So I would take canned, canned fruits, canned vegetables, don't use it if you can avoid it. I know, you know, we use a lot of tomatoes for cooking and making sauces and I try to find them in the jar rather than the can because the aluminum has a lot of toxicity there. And then in terms of the fresh versus the frozen, my personal preference is with fresh and whenever I can find it, but you know, look at the grocery store, see what they have. Some of the fresh is not that fresh. Um, you know, the fresher has the higher level of nutritional content. Some people say that when um, the food is flash frozen right after it's picked, you tend to preserve some more of the nutrients. Um, so I don't think frozen vegetables are and fruits are that bad for you. If that's the only way you can get those foods into your diet, fine. Um, I think if anything, strive for a little bit of a balance there. Excellent. Great. Um, let's see. Any thoughts on, let's, um, this person is asking about lectin-rich foods and nightshade vegetables. Is that is that something you're familiar with? And sh this person, this person is asking whether they should be avoided. I'm not familiar with that myself, but. I, yeah, I'm not either. Um, okay. The terms sound familiar, but I, I don't know. No problem at all. Um, let's see. Does ultra pasteurization negatively affect milk? I believe you already answered that one. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think it. I think it does. Here's one about organic. Thoughts on organic versus not organic. Um, that's probably been something you've looked at. Yeah, I mean, this is a very timely question. I think the, the government is actually looking to redefine what organic, and because it's a very nebulous field. What, I mean, yes. what is it? What are we really getting? I, you know, I've heard stories that if a farm engages in 20% of organic farming, then that's considered organic. And, um, 
and that's enough. Um, so I think the key is with organic is what are you purchasing, right? An organic banana, you're going to peel anyway, right? So you're taking a lot of those, the chemicals are not going into you, but an organic strawberry, you're talking about not spraying with the pesticides on the skin and then you're eating the skin. So I think you need to select the right foods for organic. So like bananas, melons, things that have a heavy peel that you're going to peel off probably doesn't matter too much, but the things that are more tender and delicate that you're going to eat, I think organic matters a little bit more. Um, the other thing, just from a practical standpoint, I've noticed that the things for the most part that are labeled organic just taste better. Um, okay. So I tend, I mean, just the taste is my main driver. And so that's why I tend to shop the organic more. So there's something different about that farming, even if it's not totally pesticide free. Yeah, and with spring right around the corner, those farmers markets will start opening up again, and that would be a great time to get that right, you know, food right from the farm. So that's and that's Absolutely. great. That's great. So like, let's take one last question here, kind of back to your um, your your medical side. What are the signs of inflammation in a gut? Like, what symptoms might people? That's probably got a long answer, but maybe you have a few <laughs> tips for folks. <laughs> I mean, I, I can tell you this, when you start to eat healthy and you start to, you really adhere to this kind of diet um, and then you deviate from it, you feel it not just in your gut, but kind of all over your energy level isn't quite the same, um, you might get sweatier more often, the skin doesn't look the same. Um, and you know, you're so you might have a little more bloating, those sorts of things, but your whole body, your energy, your aura, it's all very different. So once you switch to this kind of diet, you'll see a difference. You'll see a little pep in your step. And then when you deviate from that, you'll realize you just don't feel as good. Um, so it, it, it kind of, uh, takes you back to that healthy diet because you want to feel good again. And that's, what's really important. Fantastic. Good. Well, I know there were some other questions. I'm going to take them down and, um, you know, maybe we can um, send out those responses at a later time, um, just because I know we're running short on time right now. But I want to thank you so much, Dr. Pramija, for, for joining us today and giving this really thorough, in-depth um, presentation. It was very helpful um, and appreciate your time. And I appreciate everyone who joined us today. Thank you so much for hopping on this webinar. Um, our next our webinar next month for the healthy aging lecture will be march 24th and that's going to be on the topic of the healing power of nature we're going to have an um, ecologist and naturalist come on and talk about that relationship between again our health and the nature and the environment around us so it's a great way to kick off spring and i hope um, you all will join us for that one so have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Like I said, I'll be sending out next week some information with this um, link and the presentation. And that is all for now. Thank you so much. Thank you.